And recently, Bruce and I went to Boston where we attended the MIT Bitcoin Expo, chatted to some great people such as core developer Eric Lombroso. That was pretty fun. Yeah, it's great. Eric's a great wealth of knowledge. He's been a core developer for a long time. So he's a perfect person to talk about the difference between GitHub and Git, how decisions are made, how commits are made, how the security works, how the whole thing behind Bitcoin works. Thanks. Bitcoin core and being a Bitcoin developer is sometimes unnecessarily shrouded in a lot of mystery. You know, you have this elite team of people who are you know, managing this code. And and I think that once you actually start to explain how it all works, it you know becomes very clear and transparent pretty quickly. Yeah, the specifics of Bitcoin and the way that the open source decisions are made and the interaction with miners, it's very unusual in the world. So it's sort of, some of it is counterintuitive depending on what your background is and understanding how these decisions are made, how consensus is made, what power developers have or don't have, these kind of things aren't really easy to understand unless you either come from that background or look into it more and learn. You had a great conversation with him, here it is. Starting at the basic level, for somebody who's just coming into this space, how, how are decisions made at Bitcoin? Who's in charge, if anyone? How does it work? Explain it in layman's terms. At the base layer, you have the basically repositories. People can contribute code and they can own their own repositories, they can fork repositories, they can create uh, their own repositories, and uh, anyone can contribute to repositories or uh, uh, you know, submit pull requests where they can get other people to submit the, the uh, proposed changes and to see whether or not the maintainers of that particular repository uh, are willing to merge it in. Um, you can always uh, grab a repository, uh, if it's open source, fork it, create your own uh, fork of it, and if you're able to maintain it and you develop a you know, larger developer base than the original project, uh, in principle, you could be, you know, you could become a more a dominant force than, than the original project you forked off of. Um, I think that uh, a lot of people misunderstand the nature of of, of how this works, uh, and especially when it comes to cryptocurrencies, because uh, you know, people use, throw around the, the term fork a lot, uh, and, and forking code bases is very, very different than forking uh, some money. When you're dealing with monetary policy and, and forking tokens and stuff like that, um, it, it's a completely different thing than just like you know forking some uh, you know cool new UI for a word processor or something like that. One of the things that I really tried to work on is to make it easier to identify the level of compatibility uh, requirements for different proposals. So one of the things I did was uh, was BIP one two three. Uh, you know the, the Bitcoin improvement process. Um, this was a proposal to have every single uh, um, every single request that actually uh, modifies a protocol in any way to have to specify how uh, you know, what the compatibility requirements or how, how severe the compatibility requirements were. So the very base layer, you have something like the consensus layer, where uh, changes in uh, or disagreements there would basically fork the ledger. You'd have completely incompatible ecosystems where they can no longer communicate. I mean, they could bridge the networks. You could have exchanges that can you know exchange between the tokens like we've seen with forks, but it and makes breaking it, the ledger is bad. Well, <laughs> it definitely you know puts more into question whether we can really call it money, right? Uh, so this is a huge point of misunderstanding. I think initially people were thinking that they could fork repositories like the Bitcoin repository and and create a new coin with that, and, and it's the same as if you're forking you know Open Office or you're forking you know Linux or whatever else. It's completely different. Uh, in the case of Linux, yeah, sure, you have to have some compatibility because you want to have interoperability and be able to have, run the same applications, but people could make their own modifications and they could introduce certain incompatibilities, and, and in some cases that might even be a feature. You might not be able, you might want to want to run certain things in certain flavors of Linux where you have uh, you know, greater security requirements or stuff like that, and that's fine. Uh, but in the case of, of something like Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies in general, uh, you, you don't really ha have that uh, luxury of being able to just do that and, and uh, see if you can acquire a user base because the, the network effect is significantly larger when it comes to money. How much do you look at some of these chain forks, Bitcoin Cash and the things that have forked from those forks? Do you ever do you look at any of those repositories? Do you look at it? Is there any good code on there that Bitcoin developers want to look at? We should distinguish between code forks that actually branch off of the Bitcoin code base right. and uh, projects that basically develop their own new code base from scratch. Right. And I've worked on both of those. I've worked on uh, I worked a little bit on Litecoin, which is an example of one that forked off the Bitcoin repository. Mm -hmm. I actually uh, I actually built. Um, my own version of uh, Bitcoin Core that could support uh, different uh, currencies. We can actually change the, the network parameters easily in a, in a config file. I don't know if it's a really good idea to actually uh, be, be using that, but, but it was an idea where you could actually uh, you know, just make it very, very flexible so you could just automatically uh, change the, the, the parameters that you want and right. create your own new coin. Um, and I've also worked on other ones which are uh, complete uh, you know, ground up implementations. Uh, I, I worked on, on Ethereum and I also worked on, uh, on Ripple, uh, which became something that was very, is very different from what I initially thought that it 
might become. Interesting. Uh, yeah, so in, in these cases, I think that you have, uh, and you also have examples like Monero or uh, um, you know, Grin, or th these are really, really interesting projects where, where you really do have novelties in, in the coding. But in something like Litecoin, I mean, Litecoin, honestly, is just basically a clone of Bitcoin with some parameters changed. Right. Uh, and, and so it's not really like you have any key innovations in Litecoin that's like, oh yeah, we want to adopt that in Bitcoin too. Um, no, it actually goes in the other direction. Uh, things are uh, you know, implemented for Bitcoin. Uh, in the case of Segwit, we saw it deploy on Litecoin first just because of the politics that existed there, but it's not like that technology really came from Litecoin at all. Uh, so, so we need to distinguish these things. What would happen if somebody could take control of the GitHub and would that affect Bitcoin uh, if, if, if Vladimir or someone else went off the rails and put something in there? What, what are the risks around that? I think there's a little bit of misunderstanding between GitHub and the actual code that's run on the miners. Sure, so first I think we should distinguish between Git which is an open source tool uh, written by Linus Torvalds, a you know, Linux developer, and uh, it, it's a tool that he actually needed to, to work on the kernel for Linux, right? So, so it's just a tool. Anyone can run it on their own computer. Uh, there's no website for it that, where everyone uses it or anything like that. Then there's GitHub. GitHub is a specific website uh, where you can post, you, you can uh, um, push your repositories to, and you can collaborate with other people, you can post comments on stuff, uh, you, you can review code together, uh, you know, and have inline comments in the code and stuff like that. Um, it's, a really, it's a lot of really good features for, for collaboration, but the code repository itself actually lives on your own computer. So, so when you actually work on something like Bitcoin, you download the entire repository to your local drive, you work on it locally, um, you can add whatever changes you want. If you're working, if you're collaborating with other people on something, uh, at that moment, you actually don't post anything to the to the main repository that everyone's accessing. Uh, you just share repositories between each other, and, and you just you know pull off of each other's uh, latest uh, uh, you know uh, uh, pushes. So basically, um, uh, it's important to make that distinction first of all. So in the case of Git. It, say that, for instance, some developer goes rogue and starts to insert all sorts of stuff into the code base. Other developers can just fork the code base, and if they can pull a large amount of the development community along with them and the rest of the network along with that, right? Um, or, I mean, first of all, let's also distinguish between consensus changes and network, you know, the, the protocol changes and stuff that's just maybe some dispute over some feature, like you know, they want the, the color of the background and the UI to be different. I mean, I'm just saying something stupid, but just to, just to make the point. Um, in that kind of a situation, really, uh, it doesn't really matter. If people want to fork the code and add their own customizations to Bitcoin Core and tweak it so that it does something else special or whatever, that's totally fine. And I don't think that anyone's really against anything like that. It's only when you start to have incompatibilities where you can either get network partitions or in the worst of cases, you get you know, ledger forks uh, and entire splits of communities. Or I don't want to really call it communities because uh, you know, they don't necessarily get along. It's just people that use a basic currency, right? right? You have splits of the ecosystem. And I think that economically, that that's a, that's a very costly thing, right? It's important that, that we distinguish that because in the case of GitHub, GitHub is a centralized website. Uh, you know, now it's owned by Microsoft. In principle, they could try to censor it. I think that if uh, Microsoft were to try to push uh, you know, code repositories off for whatever reason, people would just build a different site and that would start to gain more traction. So I think that they're disincentivized to really try to crack down that way. But in principle, they could inject stuff. I mean, since they control the website, they could inject stuff into the code. Um, but fortunately, there, there are, um, ways of signing code so that you know actually which developers submitted what. Uh, there's accountability for that. And you can sign the code releases as well. You can have a build process which is pretty safe so you know that the executables you're getting are actually uh, compiled from the source code that you're looking at. Uh, so you know that people didn't insert you know, all sorts of uh, Trojan horses or viruses or who the hell knows what else into the code. So uh, GitHub is centralized, but there's ways to route around it if it became a problem. Git is decentralized, nobody controls it. Uh, even if Vladimir were to inject stuff, I seriously doubt that he could really get away with it because it would be very, very obvious and uh, right away people would start to take action to route around that. Right, and nobody would run it anyway, right? Right. I think a lot of people don't really understand how complex, particularly Bitcoin development is because there's just layers and layers of security-driven complexity. And so sometimes people come in with ideas that they think are going to be well received and doesn't always work well. What, what is your advice to somebody who's sort of new and interested in Bitcoin development to avoid that problem? Well, first of all, I think it's a, just a general problem with, with uh, uh, social networks. The fact that people are not in the same room together and it's not like you're going to get your ass kicked if you say something mean to someone, right? Like, or at least not physically. Uh, people tend to kind of be a little more uh, explicit about how they uh, you know, confront people. It's not something that's specific to Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies. Uh, people talk about toxicity in the community or whatever. I think that that's just 
uh, it, it, it's, it's a cop out. It's, it's just not wanting to accept the fact that there's a, a deep human issue that needs to be addressed here that has absolutely nothing to do with the technology. Uh, people are going to do this anyways. Um, and I, I think that people just need to understand that uh, if you want to contribute something, you need to develop your own following. You need to promote it yourself. You, you, no one else is going to promote it for you. And, and if people don't want to use it, you just have to accept that sometimes it's not going to work, right? And, and not take it personally. There's such a strong, you know, such a large network that is actually fighting off threats. Uh, there's, there's more security uh, threats reported to, to Bitcoin, you know, the people working on Bitcoin than any of these other projects by far. Uh, and and B Bitcoin developers in general are, are way more uh, proficient. I, have, I mean, just let's just be honest, they're way more proficient at the security aspects of, of dealing with this stuff in general. I'm not saying that there aren't good developers working on, on, on other stuff too, but uh, just because of the fact that it's had to withstand much more serious attacks for much more prolonged periods of time, and there's a lot more money at stake. And the open source nature of it makes it so that it's incentivized for people. If you find a flaw, if you're messing around with the code tonight, and you find a flaw that nobody else found, which is possible because there was one just back in October, right? You have every incentive in the world to immediately fix that and let other people know, and you want to get it fixed. Whereas if you, if you were CEO of Ericcoin and you had a big free mine, you're your uh, moral incentive would be to fix it, but your financial incentive would be like, uh oh, we got a problem. I got to have a secret meeting with my developers right, and right. figure out how we're going to spin this and how we're going right. to handle it. Right, the damage it, control becomes more important. And then important. fix yeah, it. And exactly. damage control becomes more important than security. Right. And in Bitcoin, it's the opposite. It's right. it, there's there, you know that even people who can't stand each other, if it's if it's a matter of real security, the whole community is going to band together and and fix that. So that's something right. you won't see. And the critical mass of how many developers are there now? Four, five hundred or something. It's something it's, like it's that, been yeah. increasing quite a bit as far as people who contributed. So yeah, and that's just people that have contributed to the actual uh, Bitcoin Core repository. Right. There's a lot of other people that contribute other repository to other repositories, other libraries that people use, um, other uh, projects or other uh, things that are used to as test frameworks or as uh, you know test nets for for different ideas. So there's a lot of other development besides just the stuff that happens on the Bitcoin Core repository. And there's other repositories too that are not Bitcoin Core that also support the. Uh, more consensus rules. So um, it's um, yeah, it's not just the number of developers. It's, it's also the fact that it's really hard to get them all to, to agree on you know a, a very specific uh, you know special interest for, of a particular nature. And in the case right. of a corporation, uh, you do have very special you know very specific interests that uh, you might have. Where where uh, whereas here, uh, it's really hard to do this and not get called out. So someone's going to call you out because because you can't fire anyone. So right. so someone's going to call you out. And there's very little that everyone agrees on. Even right. the 21 million, there's a couple weirdos who don't really agree with that. And I think that's a, a good example of anything that doesn't have 20 million wouldn't really be Bitcoin. There's just no way you could have that be a non-contentious. I mean, everything's contentious right. basically. So it's sort of like there isn't anything that would change the way the ledger works that wouldn't be contentious, right? Unless it was a, a really, really major security issue. Well, at this point, I think that it's kind of getting to that. I think in the beginning it might have not been so much like that when it was much smaller. When you have a much smaller network, obviously it's much easier to push out changes and get everyone to upgrade and stuff like that. And when you don't have so much money at stake, then people don't really care. Uh, now people get a lot more emotional about this kind of stuff. And even if you have a change that doesn't necessarily have a detrimental effect directly, uh, people can still spin it in a way for political reasons to divide people and you know to, to inject all sorts of wedges. And um, you know, people do that all the time. So. Uh, I'm, I'm skeptical in, in terms of uh, you know, human nature a lot in, in, in that. I think that people are going to tend to do that stuff and, and it's a question of whether the system can really uh, um, survive that. And I think it's, it's important that a lot of people in Bitcoin don't necessarily like each other. Because uh, if everyone likes each other and kumbaya and you know, we're all in this together, it, it becomes too, too cultish and, and people tend to start, uh, you know, self, uh, they start going into self-deception. You right. need to have people that challenge you and say, hey, you're wrong. Right. And, you know? and if you don't have that, it, it doesn't make you any stronger. You're actually going to get weaker over time. The adversarial environment is, the, is the strength. Absolutely. Because it's the opposite of, of sort of um, you know, saying yes to a leader. Right. Uh, which would be bad security. And, and, and we see that with other projects where it's sort of leadership driven. You've been an attendee of the, of the, of the round table. We all care about privacy a lot. Uh, so most people shouldn't care about a private meeting. Yet the fact when you have a private meeting and especially a popular one with a lot of people and then on top of that limited in space, that kind of creates 
uh, concerns that there's some sort of, you know, it's it sort of sounds like the old world's kind of kind of secret meetings. What are your thoughts on, you know, meetings in general and privacy and this kind of thing? There's definitely a place for people to meet in private and discuss stuff and to be able to, uh, you know, come up with their own particular ideas or whatever. Those kinds of environments facilitates communication that, that would be much harder, especially online where people talk about toxicity. When you're in person with people, it's much harder to call them an asshole or something, right. you know? So it's something where, where I think that it does kind of bring a little bit more civility at that moment, um, and it helps communication there, but I think that any decision that actually impacts the entire community should be discussed openly on public mailing lists or you know open forums and stuff like that. Uh, and, and it's very important that, that, every, that people are able to, to express their concerns and, and reservations.